And I want to brag on a couple of things as I get started this morning. One of them was, Sarah, I think the last time I heard you sing a solo, we were in Clanton together. And that's been a few years. You still have a beautiful voice. Thank you so much. What a, what a blessing that was. And then I have to say this. I got up this morning and I said, get up early Sunday and it's raining. Mm. But look at this good crowd of folks who came together to worship the Lord here at First Baptist this Sunday. I am so proud of you all. And boy, have you gotten your money's worth. As, as Dr. Hopkins said, we've had a little bit of everything today. And now, if I can just keep up, then we will have had a wonderful service in God's house. Uh, so we look forward to that. Eighth chapter of Mark is where we are today. We read together uh, verses 27 through 29. The eighth chapter of Mark is the crucial center of his gospel. Now let me remind you a few things about the gospel of Mark that you need to remember. It was the earliest of all of the gospels that were written. Mark wrote this while the events that had taken place with Jesus were still fresh in the minds of believers. There were still many people who had seen and heard the Lord Jesus. And Mark was the one that was inspired first to get the word out. It's also the shortest of all the Gospels. It is only 16 chapters. And Mark 8 is the central place of that Gospel. But for far more reasons than just the fact that it is in the middle of the book. The 8th chapter of Mark is the dividing line in its Gospel. In the first 8 chapters... Mark does something very different from what he does in the last eight chapters. In the first section of the book, Jesus reveals who he is. These chapters are full, with, full of miracles and parables. It is when Jesus faces opposition from Jewish leaders. It is when he establishes authority over demons and sickness and over the storms. But beginning with those final verses in the eighth chapter, everything changes. From then until the end of that gospel, there's only one parable that will be recorded. First half, many parables. Second half, only one. Instead, Mark records long passages of teaching about lordship, about faith, about the second coming. Mark describes significant milestones along the way in Jesus' life. The transfiguration, the tri triumphal entry, the cleansing of the temple. And on multiple occasions through the second half of Mark, Jesus will stop to teach his disciples about the coming crucifixion. The turning point of Mark 8 is found in the passage we read this morning and in the verses that followed. At the end of Mark chapter 8, Jesus has three significant conversations with his disciples. Every conversation calls these gentlemen to have to make a decision. They have to decide something about what it means to know and follow Jesus. Every time Jesus talks to them, it is crucial. Every choice they make changes everything. And the thing that we need to know this morning as we move closer to the cross, and beginning today, we're going to be talking about Jesus and the cross we're going to move toward Easter, Jesus, and the cross. We'll be in the Gospels looking at the crucifixion. But every one of the decisions that Jesus made his disciples face during those last verses of Mark 8 are the same decisions that you and I have to make today. They're the same decisions we make as we're asking the question, how seriously am I going to take my Christian faith? How real is this going to be in my life? So this morning, I want us to take some time, and I want us to look together at three crucial conversations that Jesus had, what he was doing, and what he called on people to do. So let's jump in the Bible together, and the first thing you discover is this. Jesus revealed his identity. It began with a question, who do men say that I am? The disciples had been with Jesus for a long time now. They had mingled in the crowds as they listened to Jesus talk, as they witnessed blind men made to see and miracles of fish and bread. They had listened to what was going on in the minds and the lives of the people around them. And Jesus asked the question, so what are people saying about me? When you're out there listening to the crowds, what are they saying? 
And everybody knew something was different about him. They knew that nobody had encountered Jesus and walked away unchanged. So they began to, to talk about what people were saying. And they said, some people are saying, you're John the Baptist. That you have been killed, but now you're alive again. And you're carrying on, on that prophetic ministry that John began. You're John the Baptist. Some people say you're Elijah. That you are the greatest prophet of all and he's come to life again. And he's speaking the words of God's truth. Or if not Elijah, one of the prophets. Everybody knows something, Jesus. You are not like anybody they've ever encountered. Everybody had an opinion about Jesus. And that is true today. Everybody has an opinion about Jesus. People are facing the same decision. What do you do with Jesus? And most people are reaching the same conclusion. There's something special about that carpenter from Nazareth. Anybody who has ever encountered Jesus and paid any attention at all is going to respond one way or another. Now, they may respond by rejecting him. They may respond by accepting him. They may respond by questioning him. But everybody has an opinion about Jesus. Some believe he was holy. Some believe he was wise. Some are still struggling to figure out how do you make sense out of Jesus. Then the Lord took it to a deeper level as he looked in the eyes of each of his disciples and he said, well, who do you say that I am? When it comes to Jesus, it's always personal, isn't it? This morning, I could ask the question in our crowd, what do people say about Jesus? And you could give me all kinds of answers. Some people say he was a holy man. Some people say he was a crazy man. Some people say he was irrelevant. Some people say there's never been a more important person to walk the face of the earth. But you know, when it comes down to it, it really doesn't matter what they say, does it? It really doesn't matter what they say. What matters is, what do you say? about Jesus only two things matter when it comes to Jesus the first one is this who do you believe he is in your heart of hearts in the midst of your life who do you believe he is and then the second question is just as crucial is what you believe the truth those are the two questions that matter more than anything in the world who do you say he is and is what you believe the truth you see, you can believe all kinds of things about Jesus. You can make up your own ideas about Jesus. You can reach your own conclusions about Jesus. And maybe you're here today and you're deciding, well, you know, I believe Jesus was a good man. I believe he was a holy man. I believe he was a godly man. But I don't believe he was God. But I don't believe he was divine. But I don't believe he came to bring the presence of God to earth you can decide that's what you think and that's what makes that second question so crucial is what you believe the truth because the truth is what God recorded in his word and the truth is that if you believe wrongly you're just wrong we are conditioned in our world to think you have your opinion and I have mine but we can all hang on to whatever we want to believe <sighs> that's just not so that would be almost like us standing here with flames and smoke rising and you saying to me well you may believe the church is on fire but I don't believe it's on fire I'm going to sit right here in my seat because I want to be here till the very end of the service it really doesn't matter what you think if what you think is not the truth. And that's why Peter spoke for himself and for the others. He said, you are the Christ. Who do you say that I am, Peter? You are the Christ. It's the first time he'd ever really let those words slip out of his mouth. He had watched what Jesus had done. He had heard what Jesus had said. He had been a witness to all of the things that had taken place around Jesus. 
But now he had to decide, who do you say I am? You are the Christ. A simple statement with a world of meaning. When he said, you are the Christ, do you understand what he was saying to the Lord? He was saying, you are the fulfillment of God's promises. You are the answer to our prayers. You are the Savior we've been expecting. You are the Lord. You are God. You are God. And in this first conversation, Jesus established his identity and his authority. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ. He was revealing himself to be the Messiah, the one who would save his people, that he was the eternal word who ruled heaven and earth, that he was the son of God who would bring the kingdom of God into the midst of men. You are the Christ. Never make the mistake of thinking that that term Christ is just Jesus' last name. That's what most people think. Yeah, his first name was Jesus, his last name was Christ. Jesus Christ. Christ was a term of authority and reverence and divinity. You are the one who was promised. You are the Redeemer. You are the Savior. That's who you are. And it's important to understand that because that's the truth. That's the truth. Before Jesus can be who he wants to be in your life, you have to understand who he has revealed himself to be. Because it's not what you want to think and it's not what you want to believe it is what he says he is I am he reveals himself he is not discovered and he has revealed himself to be the Christ and in that first conversation we recognize that here's the truth before you can do anything else in your life spiritually you have to settle that who is God God is Jesus. Jesus is the Savior. You are the Christ. And it was on the bedrock of that first conversation that then Jesus initiated another. The Bible says he revealed what he had come to accomplish. It says he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spoke this word to them Openly, openly, without disguise, not subtly, not so that they would have to figure it out for themselves. He wanted them to understand, you have now confessed, I am the Christ. Now I'm telling you, before the Christ lies the cross. Jesus was on his way to the cross. He wanted his disciples to understand nothing that was going to happen was an accident. He wanted them to understand not for one second would he be the victim of those who would crucify him. Instead, he was accomplishing what God had always planned. He followed the conversation about being the Christ with a revelation that the cross was essential if he was going to be the Savior. I am the Christ. That's who I am. When I go to the cross... I become the Savior, the perfect sacrifice, the one who will give his life a ransom for many. The Lord would transform an instrument of suffering and death into the means of salvation. But he also made it clear there was no other way than the cross. If I am going to be who my Father sent me to be, if I am going to accomplish what my Father sent me to accomplish, the only path before me is the path to the cross. It was more than Peter was ready to hear. He didn't want his master to suffer. He couldn't imagine that the Messiah would have to die. He didn't want to hear that the cross was the only way. And I'm sure that somewhere inside of him was the conviction that if Jesus started talking about the cross too much, the crowds were going to melt away. This is too hard a saying. 
We don't need to hear this, Jesus. The Bible says Peter took the Lord aside and began to rebuke him. Understand, that means he corrected the Lord with strong language. He took him aside, and he didn't correct him, and he didn't gently nudge him. He said, Lord, what are you talking about? You know absolutely that's not what's going to happen to you. There's no way on earth we would let it happen to you. That is not what God said would happen to the Christ. Everything you're saying, it's wrong. It's wrong. Stop saying these things. Isn't that just the way we are as believers? We really don't want the Lord to tell us the hard things that come with following him. We really don't want to hear about the struggles and the suffering and the sacrifice that's involved in following Christ. We love the blessings. We claim the promises. We depend upon the assurances. But when the conversation turns to the things you have to surrender, to the price of the cross, we're just like Peter. Lord, I don't want to hear about that. Don't talk about that hard stuff. We want to tell the Lord, God, people only really want to hear the encouraging stuff. Don't talk to us about the hard stuff. And here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus rebuked Peter in return. Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Now understand, Jesus was not calling Peter. Peter, Satan, he was talking about the satanic response that Peter had offered to the news of the cross. He was talking about the fact that everything Peter was saying was something that came from the, from the demonic one, from Satan himself. What was that satanic attitude? That Jesus should choose another way. You don't have to do this. The cross doesn't have to be there. There's got to be another way. Let's do that. There has to be an easier path. And in saying that, you realize what Peter was doing. Peter was believing his opinion was superior to Christ's revelation. He was believing he knew a better way to do things. What Peter was trying with all of his heart to do was to take the cross out of the equation. Jesus, you can accomplish everything you came to do. You can come to seek and save that which was lost. But the cross doesn't have to be there. There's got to be a way to trust in God. There has to be a way to eternal life. There has to be a way to resurrection that doesn't involve a crucifixion and a death. As well-meaning as he was, if Peter had his way, he would overturn the will of God. He would say, don't do what you came to do. Why do I think Jesus said, get behind me, Satan? Because every word that came out of Peter's lips reminded Jesus of that time at the very beginning of his ministry, that temptation in the wilderness when time after time after time the devil continued to say, change the way you're going to do things. Go another way. Choose an easier path. And now here at the end, once again, he hears the echo of that voice. Try another way. Turn away from the cross. And Jesus responds just the way he did at the beginning. You see, Jesus knew, and we have to remember, God's plan always comes first. You have to do it his way. You don't get to vote on the plan of God. So many times in our lives, we all face situations and decisions where we believe we have a better way than the way the Lord is showing us. When we have wisdom to do things a different way from the way he has revealed in his word. That's when we need to remember God's ways are always best and his plans are perfect. Peter had to learn, and we need to remember, Jesus doesn't always call us to understand. Sometimes he calls us to trust and obey. 
The third conversation was the most challenging of all. It happened just after Jesus had rebuked Peter. Christ looked at the people gathered around him, at the 12 who had been with him all this time, and he declared, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? The Lord didn't stop by just talking about his own crucifixion. He had taken the time to tell them about what was lying before him, but then he followed through and he said, and I'm not the only one who needs to understand the cross because you're going to have to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. If you're going to follow Jesus, then you have to send self-will to the cross. That's really what he was saying. Peter, you're going to have to put your plans down. You're going to have to put aside the things you prefer. You're going to have to step beyond your own wisdom, and you're just going to have to trust me. You have to choose to make him your personal Lord. His will has to come first. You can't live for your own satisfaction. You can't choose the path that please you most. You can't go the easy way. It's what he said to Peter. It's what he says to you. To follow Jesus means you put his will and his way first in your life. Lord, What do you want? Where are you leading? I know it won't always be easy, but I don't want easy. I want obedient. Where are you leading me? It's recognizing the truth of 1 Corinthians 6.20, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The message of the cross is this. You were bought at a price. He paid an ultimate price for your salvation. And when you understand that, you also understand, and my my goal in life is to glorify God. Wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, to glorify Jesus. That means you have no right to put any limits on your availability to the Lord. And that's where true joy comes from. From real surrender to Christ. No turning back. No turning back. But you have to choose. Jesus said it clearly. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. And every one of those steps requires a personal decision and an act of obedience. Every one of those commands means you've got to do something with Jesus. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Or, in your life, for yourself, who do you say that I am? Can you answer that this morning by simply saying, you are the Christ. You are the Savior. You are the Redeemer. You are the one who would not step aside And avoid the cross. Because it was the only way for me to be saved. If you're not saying that this morning. If you're not a believer. Then today's the day when you need to settle that issue. You need to decide. This is the day I yield my life to Jesus. I live under his command. I follow in obedience. I trust him. Whether I understand or whether I don't. Because I belong to him. If you're here today and you need to know Jesus, in a moment we're going to stand and we're going to sing an invitation hymn and I'm going to be here at the front. 
Dr. Hutchins is going to be here at the front. And all you got to do is come and say, I want to know Jesus. And we'll help you find him. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, I need to be part of a church that lifts up Jesus and lives in the shadow of the cross. And this is the place I think God is leading me to. And today you need to come and join this fellowship. Maybe there's another decision. A decision about surrender. Maybe there's somewhere where in your own life you've been pushing back and saying, Lord, there's got to be another way. There's got to be an easier path. Lord, I'm not sure I'm ready to surrender to this extent. And it's time for you to settle and surrender whatever it is God's dealing with you about. Maybe there's another decision. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. The Holy Spirit's speaking to you. You come. Let's stand together.